What if I told you that you could leave a GCSE maths exam knowing that you had already secured a certain number of the marks? In this video, I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. In a maths exam, there are lots of topics that you can actually do the reverse of after you've answered the question to make sure you have got the right answer. So starting us off, factorising and expanding into brackets. Let's say you have a question that says expand 3 bracket x plus 2. So you would do your claw method as normal, do your workings, and you would get an answer of 3x plus 6. Now, if we think about what the opposite of expanding is, that is factorising. If we try and factorise that expression back into brackets, we should get exactly what we started with. So 3x plus 6, we can take a 3 out of the expression, out of the bracket, and have x plus 2 inside, which is back to the starting question that we had. So if you do that in an exam, you can walk out knowing 100% that you've got those one or two marks. Now, some of you may argue this is quite a basic example and you're fairly confident with this stuff anyway. You can do exactly the same with a quadratic. So this time, let's say we use x squared minus 2x minus 63. Now, if we try and factorise that, we do the usual. We try and find two numbers that times to make minus 63. In this case, it would be minus 9 and 7 and we would put those into our brackets just like this. Now, expanding double brackets, we just use the double claw method, apply the rules exactly like this, and it will take us back to our original quadratic, assuming we've done the right thing. Now, this is just one of many topics that we can do exactly this for and check our answers. Another example is with nth term. This could be linear nth term or quadratic nth term. Let's say we have the sequence of one, 5, 9, 13, and 17. We would find our first difference, which is adding 4 each time. So we know our nth term is going to be 4n. You would write the 4 times table underneath and take it away from your original sequence, and you will find you get minus 3 at the bottom. This means our nth term is 4n minus 3. Now, this is an answer you could get, and if you have an extra minute or two spare in your exam, you can go through and double check that you've got the right answer. So, for example, with nth term, if you want to rebuild that sequence using the nth term you've just worked out, all you have to do is substitute the numbers 1, 2, and 3 for the n. So, if we have 4n minus 3 and we substitute a 1 in there, we're going to get 4 minus 3, which is 1. If we substitute 2 in there, same process, we're going to get 5. Substitute a 3, we're going to get 9. If you look back to the original sequence, the original sequence was 1, 5, and 9. So that just goes to show that we've got the nth term correct. And again, you can do exactly the same thing for quadratic nth term. So here is a sequence. Try and find the nth term of it, and then substitute the numbers back in to rebuild the sequence just to prove to yourself that you got it right. The next topic that this applies to is solving equations. Now, solving equations come in many, many different forms. This could be linear equations where you just have a singular x value. This could be quadratic equations where we're trying to solve an equation that has an x squared and an x in it, or even simultaneous equations. So here is an example where we would do this for solving linear equations. So as you can see, we have our original equation and we do our usual steps to get the x values. What we can then do is take that x value and substitute it back into the original equation and the equation should be true so that the left hand side equals the right hand side. This is how you know you've done it right. Doing the same thing for a quadratic sequence, we would again, you can either complete the square, do the quadratic formula or factorise it. If you get your x values, we can substitute both of those back in and again, the left hand side should equal the right hand side. If you haven't got this and the left hand side is not equal to the right hand side, then maybe go back because you may have made a mistake. And finally, for simultaneous equations, you will get an x value and a y value, sometimes two of each. But if you take both of those and substitute them back in, the left hand side should equal the right hand side and you've got your marks. Now, especially with the simultaneous equations, these are usually worth three or four marks. If you could walk out of that exam knowing for sure that you've picked up that three or four mark question, then that could be a real confidence boost going into the rest of your exams. Our fourth example of where we can apply this is sharing values into a ratio. Now, a ratio question would typically consist of share £200 into the ratio 2 to 3. If we do this, we would add up the ratio 2 and 3 to get 5, divide the 200 by the 5, which would get us 40, 
and then times the 2 and the 3 by the 40 that we just worked out. Now 2 times 40 would be 80, and 3 times 40 would be 120. You can then go back and just double check that do those two values add up to what they should in the original. And as you can see, 80 add 120 does in fact equal 200. For those of you doing higher, recurring decimals into fractions is a very common topic and some people struggle with it. Now, if you do the usual steps to turn this recurring decimal into this fraction, using the x, 10x, 100x, whatever you need to do, you can use bus stop to do the opposite. You can then see that the original decimal you had in your question should be at the top of your bus stop. If you've done this and they match up, you've got the right answer. One that is overlooked by a lot of people and a lot of teachers do not mention this is generally speaking, they are called compound measures, but this is referring to density, pressure, and speed specifically. If you're ever in an exam and you forget the equations for either speed, density, or pressure, they most of the time will have the units for you in the answers just next to the answer space. So for example, density is often kilograms per meter cubed. Now kilograms per meter cubed refers to a division, where we have kilograms on the top and meters cubed as the denominator. Think about what values we know that have kilograms as a unit and also meters cubed as a unit. Kilograms are often relating to a mass and meters cubed are relating to volume. This means that density is mass divided by the volume. Now you can repeat exactly this with the pressure and the speed, where pressure is normally newtons per meter squared and speed is meters per second. So try and make sure you can do this before your next exam, as you never know where it will be useful. Another really common question where we can use this is with straight line graphs. Let's say we have an equation for a straight line graph and we need to draw it. So if you're not too confident with it, you could do your coordinate grid where we have the X and the Y values. You substitute in the X values and then you get the Y coordinates and you plot them and graph them as normal. Afterwards, have a look at that line and pick a coordinate on it. Let's say this is the coordinate 1, 2. If we substitute the 1 where the x's are and the 2 where the y's are, assuming we've plotted it correctly, the left hand side should equal the right hand side. Because in theory, all an equation of a line is, is a series of coordinates where the x and the y value satisfy the equation that the line represents. We can also do this when converting an improper fraction into a mixed number. So let's say you have a question like this, where we have to turn 3 and 2 sevenths into an improper fraction. We would do our multiplying and our adding, and we would get 23 over 7. Now, as long as you know how to go back from an improper fraction into a mixed number, we would be able to get exactly back to the original question that they asked us. And finally, the last place we can use this is when we're calculating the product of prime factors of any number. So the product of prime factors is when you write a number like this, and you do your prime factor trees, or if you saw my last video, you can do it on the calculator. But let's say we have the number 105. If we did our factor tree for this, it would look a bit like this. So we'd have three times five times seven. Now, just to make sure you've done the calculations correctly, when you have done your prime factor tree, it's always worth just double checking that three times five times seven does in fact make 105. Now, collectively, let's say that almost all of these topics came up because they're all fairly common topics. You could now walk out of that exam knowing that 100% you've got maybe 20 to 25 out of the 80 marks. And that is a lot. If you're doing a higher paper and you're just trying to get a four or a five, all you really need is 20 to 30 marks and you have got a comfortable pass. So if you found this useful, please consider liking and subscribing. Thank you very much for watching and good luck in your exams.